Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Collaborative Leadership, Security and IT on a Mission, presented by Security Management Magazine and sponsored by Pivot3. Pivot3 is a technology and performance solutions provider for hyper-converged infrastructure designed to reduce cost, operational risks, and ease overall system management. My name is Mike Moran. I'm the Learning Content Director with ASIS International, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's presentation will be one hour, including time reserved at the close for questions and answers. We encourage you to submit a question at any time in the Q&A panel. If you hold an ASIS International certification, your attendance today is approved for one hour of continuing education toward that recertification. You will receive an email from us tomorrow that documents your attendance and can be submitted to ASIS in fulfillment of your recertification requirements. This email will also contain a link to the archived version of today's event. We ask that you share this link with your peers and on your social network. Um, your ongoing support in spreading the word is vital is a vital part in our ability to continue to offer these programs at no cost to attendees. Our presenter today is Brandon Reich. Brandon is a surveillance business leader at Pivot3. In this role, he leads all product and go-to-market strategy for Pivot3's global video surveillance portfolio. Brandon has a long career in security consulting and engineering in large enterprise critical infrastructure. And he holds a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering and an MBA with a focus in entrepreneurship, both from the University of Louisville. Go Cardinals! So let me turn it over now to Brandon for today's agenda. Brandon? Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you for that Go Cardinals reference. That was great. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining today. Uh, uh, we got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to go ahead and, and jump right in. We're going to talk about some of the trends, uh, both in the physical security world and specifically video surveillance, as well as this emerging category called IoT. We'll talk about what that is and why it's important to you. And then some of the uh, conflicts and challenges that often come up when working between the security function of an organization and the IT function. But we're also going to take a look at what are some of the latest trends and technologies in the IT world, particularly the data center world, that we can help leverage or we can leverage to help us in our physical security deployments as well. We're going to look at what some of the business impacts of those technologies are, and then we'll wrap up by looking at some real world examples and of course taking some Q&A. So just to get started here, I think most of the people on this call, given that it's sponsored by Security Management Magazine, uh, will understand really what's happening in the security world. We, we all know that while the risk environment, the things that we're protecting aren't necessarily changing that much, um, certainly the threats against those risks are changing. And so we're in increasingly turning to new types of technology and older types of technology to give us the things that we need, like real-time analysis and response. Uh, but what we may not often think about or be aware of are the implications that all of the advancements in this new technology have, particularly on our underlying technology and IT infrastructure. And suddenly today, all of this data being generated by video surveillance and other applications is more important to us than ever before. And therefore, we have really zero tolerance for any downtime or data loss. And we can also have some challenges in other areas as well that may be different than we had just a few years ago. So as we think about infrastructure solutions, underlying infrastructure that runs all of this great technology that we have, we need to think about solutions that deliver performance, resiliency, and scalability to match the modern technology. So a little bit later in the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about what that means. But video surveillance right now is really going through a renaissance, what we call a, a big time change. We're seeing new technology, new uses of that technology, um, certainly lots of new buzzwords, some of them real, some of them not so real. But one thing is absolutely true um, across the board not just in the U.S., but really globally, and that is video is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, and it's leading to a pretty significant change in the world that we live in today and that we live in and we work in today. 
Now, video surveillance is actually at the forefront of what we call the IoT revolution. IoT, if you're not familiar with it, IoT is a, is a new buzzword, stands for the Internet of Things. And while there are lots of different definitions of what IoT is, when we look at it, we really look at IoT being the ability to transform data that's being generated by millions and millions of sensors of all different kinds. Sensors could be cameras, they could be um, other sensors and security sensors, it could be operational sensors, lots of different sensors out there, all of them generating data. The ability to transform that data into some kind of intelligence that we can use to take an action of some sort. So we talk about transforming that data into actionable intelligence. Now video surveillance has been around for many years. Video surveillance certainly isn't new technology, but advancements in that technology and new use cases for video surveillance technology and, and also declining costs of the technology are really driving demand for video surveillance to unforeseen levels. And we're, I'll show you some example of that here in just a second. But as a result of that, video is increasingly moving out of the traditional security closet uh, that we have um, sort of symbolically consider video surveillance to have been in in the past and into the data center, meaning that we're seeing new owners and new expectations come from our IT counterparts out there, things like virtualization, management, cloud technology. We're going to talk about um, all of those things here in just a couple of minutes. But to further demonstrate this, let's look at some of the numbers and some of the projections. The chart on the left of this slide shows that this year in 2018, we are expecting over almost 90 million new video surveillance cameras to be produced and, and shipped and deployed this year. And next year, actually breaking the 100 million barrier. Now what the chart doesn't show is that these cameras are consistently higher and higher resolution. And so we're shipping more cameras, those cameras cost less, they're higher and higher resolution. What all that means is we're, we're, it's leading to massive generation of new data. And actually, if you look at the chart on the right, this is put together by one of the leading IT analyst firms out there, you'll see that video surveillance is actually the largest big data application in the world by far. In 2018, video surveillance cameras will generate uh, just north of about 24 zettabytes of new data. Now, to put that in comparison, the next closest application, one called data processing, which I think is a catch-all term for things like credit card transactions and other things that happen in a data center, is just about half that amount. Okay, so video surveillance is generating huge amounts of data, and this deluge of, of new data has really significant implications on your underlying IT infrastructure, which that also now introduces new challenges for you. Now, many of you uh, might recognize uh, this scenario. If we, uh, oftentimes our security departments and our IT departments are coming together on all these new technologies, and oftentimes we're conflicted. But one thing that's, that's true is that because of all of these new applications, because of all of this data growth, IT is increasingly involved in physical security deployment and management, or at least in the infrastructure piece of it. So it's important for us to understand now that security people, and I think, again, most people on this call probably come from the security side of the house. Um, some of them hopefully come from the IT side of the house as well. But it's important for us to understand that security people and IT people oftentimes think a little bit differently. To a security person, what a security person is typically concerned about in their technology are things like no downtime, no data loss. These are mission critical systems. Of course, we want to control cost, but we also look for solutions that, that are quote unquote open, that don't require a lot of technical integration, that are reliable, that are very simple for us to manage. 
uh, ultimately, we are not, as security professionals, we are not in the business of managing technology. We're in the business of managing risk. And we want to do so using technology, but we want to do so in a way that technology does not get in our way of being able to manage that risk. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, our IT counterparts look at things a little bit differently. Of course, they are also concerned about preventing downtime and data loss and controlling costs, just like we are. But overall, IT's job is to manage technology. And so, and they manage it for more than just our physical security applications. They manage it for typically every type of technology um, in the entire business. So what they are concerned about are things like vendor familiarity, workload consolidation. What that means is, you know, consolidating multiple different applications onto a single infrastructure, a single platform simplifying the management of the underlying infrastructure and integrating with tools they're familiar with, providing information security. So ultimately what's important to the IT department is managing the complexity of the underlying technology that it takes to run all of this stuff. So you see that our goals can oftentimes be different. And so we wonder, how do we resolve these conflicts? How do we, how do we ensure that our security department and our IT departments can work together harmoniously to ensure that we ultimately drive the goals of the business or the organization that you work for. And the answer to that is to play the role of educator. Now, before I jump into how we educate and what we educate on, I think we have a polling question here. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike to, to handle the polling. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the things that our, our audience is like most is is to see where uh, where their peers stand in different areas. So this is one question towards that. Question being, who performs the day to day management of the server and storage infrastructure for your video system? IT department, security department, an outsourced third party, no one, or other. I'm going to give you just a moment. You weigh in on that. Okay, very good. Uh, so let's see where we stand. We have uh, just about 200 people answering at this point. Um, the overwhelming majority are, are report that the IT department is responsible. 23% security department. Just 3% uh, uh, indicate uh, other and outsourced third party, and another 3% say no one. Uh, Brandon, what do you think of those results? Is that what you expected to see? It, it is, yeah, it's actually, it's very interesting. Um, you know, our experience in the past, over the past couple of years, has been roughly about 50-50. And what we're starting to see now is that, um, that tilt a little bit more towards IT, and, and that I think that's really reflected here in these results. Um, so that that's very interesting, and I think that it'll make the rest of this conversation very germane to us. Now, I'm, I'm interested in the the three percent that said no one as well. That's a little bit alarming, but um, uh, yeah, the certainly interesting results there. Okay, so let's talk about the process of educating our IT counterparts. Again, I think most people on this call come from the security side of the house, most likely. Um, so it's going to be up to us oftentimes to educate our IT counterparts on our physical security technologies and goals. We need to educate them on the fact that video is different. It's different than the other applications that they host in their data center. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about each one of these as we go on. Um, conventional technologies, particularly infrastructure technologies, don't necessarily work very well for video surveillance and physical security. However, some of these big emerging IT trends uh, can be leveraged very well in, uh, in, in physical security technologies. But if we work together and we take the best of both worlds and we deploy, employ some best practices, we can achieve all of our goals together, our, our security and risk management goals, as well as our technology and complexity goals, and your life as the IT provider and your life as the security professional uh, can be made simpler and easier. So let's first talk about the fact that video is different. 
video is unique than pretty much any other type of application or workload that they host in their data center. So when we plan out our infrastructure, there are a couple of things that we, that we have to think about and we have to consider. The first is performance. And when I say performance here, what I mean is the infrastructure, the server, the storage, the network, the underlying infrastructure's ability to take in or to ingest all of this video data that's being generated. Video, unlike any other application in the data center, is very write intensive. And data spikes are a very common thing in video surveillance. This combination can quickly overwhelm traditional storage infrastructure that's built for a general purpose, um, general purpose IT application. And that overwhelming that infrastructure leads to something called frame loss. Frame loss is translated into things like image quality degradation and per perhaps even loss of entire segments of video, which ultimately reduces the overall effectiveness of the security system. So we have to be concerned about performance. Secondly, we have to be concerned about resiliency. Believe it or not, hardware, infrastructure hardware that's used in video surveillance is three times more likely to fail when it's used for video than when it's used for non-video applications. And that relates back to what I just talked about, about it being a very write intensive kind of application. Now what's more is that conventional methods that our IT departments are familiar with for, use, for protecting against downtime and data loss, many of those either don't work for video surveillance. You know, for example, you can't use snapshots in, in uh, video surveillance, it just doesn't work. Um, or they can be very prohibitively expensive in these very storage intensive kind of environments. So we have to think about different ways of protecting ourselves against downtime and data loss. And then lastly, one of the, um, one of the very known and the worst kept secrets in the video world is that video surveillance systems never get smaller and they almost always get bigger. Uh, there could be lots of different reasons for that. It could be new cameras, new technologies, changing environments, changing budgets. There's lots of different reasons why systems get larger. But a common misperception out there is that in order to keep up, we, we just simply have to scale storage capacity to, to handle all the, the, uh, the larger system. And that's not true. We need to be able to, to scale storage, compute, and bandwidth capacity, typically in a linear fashion, but it must be done in a very simple, in a non-disruptive manner, you know, without disrupting the operation of our existing systems. So before I tell you how you can go out and, and leverage new IT technologies to solve all these problems, let's take a quick look at the options that you have at your behest for video surveillance and physical security infrastructure today. The one that most people are going to be the most familiar with Network video recorders or NVRs. This is where we simply take a standard off the shelf server, bundle it together with some video management software and deploy it as a, an appliance. In the storage world, we refer to this as direct attached storage or DAS. And really this architecture is somewhat aged, fairly antiquated in the IT world, um, really doesn't work very well for larger, more enterprise systems. My, my guess is that you're probably not considering this architecture, um, but, but if you are, I want you to consider it very closely. You know, NVRs were designed to look, feel, and act like older analog VCRs and DVRs. But as cameras went from analog to digital technology, the underlying infrastructure needs really completely changed as well. And as a result, NVRs, can work pretty well for smaller systems. They, they function just fine there, but it really pose a lot of challenges as those systems get larger and larger. It can be challenging um, to obtain the, the needed retention time. Uh, you can have challenges around performance, single points of failure. It can be very difficult to manage lots and lots of these NVRs separately from each other, but not necessarily an, an ideal solution. Now on the other end of the spectrum, our IT departments would say, well, we have enterprise Store, uh, server and storage solutions, and we can solve these problems. We have separate application servers, physical or virtual, and they all kind of combine together and, and uh, access a, a shared storage 
platform like a SAN or a NAS. And this architecture can solve a lot of the challenges that the NVRs have for larger systems. But the biggest problem they have is performance. They're built for a general purpose IT application, and therefore they tend to perform very poorly for a video surveillance type of application because of what we talked about before. In addition to that, these solutions are oftentimes big, extremely expensive, built on proprietary hardware and extremely complex uh, to manage, oftentimes requiring people, highly trained, highly paid, dedicated people just to manage them on a day in, day out basis. So I wanna shift gears for just a second because I think it's also important for you as a security professional to understand what's happening in the world of IT and how this can directly impact you and what you're doing inside of your organization. Like most functions, IT organizations a number of years ago um, began looking for ways to reduce costs and complexity inside of their, their, um, their organizations, and they took a hard look at their data centers. And what they found was that these data centers are actually really massive cost centers for them. And so some of the big major IT innovators out there, names that you know of and have heard of before, took a different approach. And they said, let's come up with a way to reduce costs, to reduce complexity by eliminating all of the big, expensive, proprietary hardware, um, the complex management and everything that goes into the traditional data center and replacing it with our own infrastructure that we've built based on software running on low cost commodity hardware. Now that's great for big companies like the Amazon and the Googles and the Facebook who probably have 20,000 IT people uh, working for their companies, but most organizations don't have the ability to go out and do this on their own. So they, look, they need then a, a commercially available solution that has the same kind of features and benefits of being able to reduce costs, reduce complexity, and leverage low-cost hardware solutions that run special software. And that's led to a category of technology that's now known as hyper-converged infrastructure. Now, I don't want you to be overwhelmed by the name or the nomenclature here. Hyperconverged infrastructure is just a term. It's just a buzzword. Uh, what it really means, what hyperconverged infrastructure really means is replacing that big, expensive, proprietary hardware that most traditional data centers were built on with software that now runs on low-cost commodity server hardware. Now this concept here of hyperconverged infrastructure is transforming the data center. It's highly disruptive in the world of data center infrastructure technology. It can deliver better agility, it can help reduce costs, it can even deliver better performance in some cases like that. And this is really taking over uh, that, that, um, that data center infrastructure world. The first generation of hyperconverged infrastructure was a very niche kind of solution. It was very much built for single applications or single workloads. But now it has evolved to really become very mainstream to really replace large pieces and large segments of data center infrastructure. And what's more is that our IT departments love it. They love this idea. Lower cost, lower complexity, easier deployment, easier management, easier scaling, everything's just easier. We're helping to you know, achieve all of our goals. Now I tell you this because here at Pivot3, we've taken the concept of hyper-converged infrastructure and we've applied it directly to those unique needs of video surveillance and IoT applications. Remember earlier I told you that video is different and really IoT in general is different than other applications out there. So without getting too technical, I'm not gonna go into the, into the details of how the technology works, 
But if you look at the architecture, or excuse me, the, uh, the diagram on the left-hand side of the page here, what you'll see is that we really take the best of both worlds. We start with the same low-cost commodity hardware as NVRs. In fact, it, and oftentimes it is the same hardware as NVRs. And then we put special software on those servers or on those NVRs to turn groups of them, or, or as we call them, clusters, into an, a single enterprise class data center infrastructure that is specifically optimized for a video surveillance and an IoT application. Now again, I'm happy to, uh, in a separate forum, take you through all of the underlying technology and the benefits of this kind of solution, uh, excuse me, the underlying technology and the way that this works, but I wanna focus here today just on what are the benefits? Why should you care about doing something like this? And they're listed on next to those check marks on the right-hand side of the screen. First and foremost, we help you eliminate downtime and eliminate data loss, delivering the highest levels of resiliency, ensuring that your systems, your live video, your recorded video, all of your other integrated systems associated with that, they're always online, they're always operational, and all the data associated with those systems is always accessible even when major hardware failures occur. Secondly, as we will achieve the highest levels of performance, there's a real challenge in video surveillance to eliminate frame drops and ensure that you maximize the effectiveness of your security system, but will sustain that level of performance, again, even when hardware failures occur. Okay, so we're protecting you against what can be real challenges when hardware failures occur in these mission critical environments. Thirdly, we're highly scalable. We enable you to start small, and then by simply adding a single box or a single node to a cluster, as we call it, adding storage, compute, and bandwidth to the entire cluster and doing so in a very simple and a non-disruptive manner allows you to easily scale your solutions over time as your needs change. And then lastly, we help you reduce cost and complexity of your overall systems and the underlying infrastructure. We have integrated server virtualization technology. We enable you to consolidate workloads and applications so while we, we've solved this for video surveillance, we can also host access control systems and video analytics and PSIM and visitor management and whatever system is out there can all be consolidated onto the same common resilient infrastructure. And then we automate a lot of the day-to-day -day maintenance that hap happens in the background. It means we greatly simplify the deployment and management of an enterprise class solution like this. So something like this satisfies the security functions needs for a resilient infrastructure that helps them manage organizational risk, and it also satisfies the IT department's needs for controlling cost and complexity with technology that they're familiar with. So what are the impacts what are the business impacts? How do we tie these great technology solutions and infrastructure now to actual impacts, measurable impacts that we can, uh, that we can um, prove out in our organizations? Better resiliency, preventing downtime and data loss leads to a reduction in risk. Ensuring that we protect ourselves against liabilities, that we can always respond to incidents when they occur, that we have access to um, investigative information when necessary, and all the other reasons that we want to ensure to protect the, the resiliency of our system. Performance, as I mentioned before, means we maximize the effectiveness of our systems. These higher and higher resolution cameras with all these great new technologies associated with them can be a real challenge for traditional infrastructure solutions to solve. We ensure that your system always operates at peak effectiveness. Higher density, consolidating multiple applications together means we can help you reduce costs. 
We know cost reduction is important for both the security department as well as the IT department. And then, of course, the overly simplified management of this ensures that our IT needs and expectations are met and helps them manage and lower the total cost of ownership even after the solution has been deployed and implemented. So the last uh, piece of my my commercial uh, slide here, commercial pitch. So a, a question that I I often am asked is, who are you integrated with? Who do you work with in the industry? And my response to that is, hyperconverged infrastructure HCI, by its very nature, is an open platform. Okay, by its nature, if a software platform works on in a standard Windows or a Linux environment on an x86 processor in, in, in a virtualized environment, which virtually all of them do, then it's going to work on a hyperconverged infrastructure platform. But at Pivot 3, we've gone one step further. We are not only an open platform, but we have tested and in many cases certified and deployed with virtually every one of the major video management software um, developers and camera manufacturers out there. And in addition to that, we are increasingly uh, strengthening our partnerships with some of the newer uh, technologies coming out around video analytics, artificial intelligence, and all the great new advancements and innovations that we've been hearing about out there recently. Okay, so before I put the proof in the pudding, so to speak, here and show you some of the real world examples of how this can be deployed and how we can leverage security and IT together, I think we have another polling question for you. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, this is Mike again. Let's uh let's go ahead and reach back out to the audience and uh and get some answers on this one. What are your plans for advanced video technologies over the next three to five years? I plan to use more video analytics, but not cloud. <coughs> Excuse me. I plan to use cloud, but not video analytics. I plan to use both cloud and video analytics. I don't plan to use either cloud or video analytics. So I'm going to give you just a moment to answer that. Okay. <coughs> okay, again, we got about a little over 200. Excuse me. And... Uh, Brandon, looks like 36% uh, plan to use it, video analytics, but not the cloud. Just 1.6% plan to use the cloud, but not video analytics. Our largest percentage, uh, I plan to use both cloud and video analytics at 54%. And 8.2% have no interest in either. What do you think of those results, Brandon? I, I, again, I think that's very interesting and is really indicative of the change that we are seeing um, across the industry today. You know, video analytics are not new, the co or at least the concept of video analytics are not new. They've been around for a decade or more. Uh, it, and the promise of video analytics have been around for a long time. But what we all recognize and acknowledge is that they weren't necessarily adopted as quickly as we had all thought they would be because, quite frankly, they just didn't work very well. You know, they, they just didn't work very well. And we're starting to see that change. We are, again, in the midst of what I think is a, a huge change in the world of video analytics technology um, and artificial intelligence under, underpinned by things like machine learning and, and uh, neural networking and other technologies like that that are truly starting to bring the promise of video analytics into reality. And so it's very interesting to me to see that, that the interest level in video analytics increasing, as well as the cloud. You know, cloud is, is a, an area that I think we overuse from a buzzword standpoint. Um, we all have a, a, a thought of what cloud is, but there's, there's really a lot more to it than that. So very interesting to me to see um, that high level of response. So thank you, everyone, for those. Okay, so let's um, get back to it now, and let's jump into some real-world examples of how 
IT and security can work together and have worked together to, to deliver these real world benefits that we have talked about before. The first one I wanna talk about, University of Central Florida. So a little bit of background on this. UCF is the, I believe it's the second largest campus in the US and I think that that's defined by enrollment and I know there's different definitions to that so don't quote me on that but somewhere that's a very large university a number of years ago at UCF they had an active shooter event and they had an active shooter they were in pursuit of this person um, around this extremely large campus and they had lots of video surveillance all around the campus and believe it or not public safety actually had access to that video which is great the problem was that it took public safety about four hours, in some cases up to eight hours, to actually access that video properly in real time. And what that means is while they were in pursuit of this suspect, they had all this great technology that they couldn't use, right? They did not have the level of situational awareness that they thought they would have while they were in pursuit of the suspect. So luckily in, in this particular scenario, um, this person's gun jammed and he didn't cause any major uh, harm to other people around the campus other than to himself. But after the incident was mitigated, the university quickly looked into all of their technology, all of their security systems, all of this great video they had all around campus. And they said, why didn't this work? What, what is it that we're going to do? Turns out what they found is that they just had way too many systems owned by way too many people and managed by way too many interested parties at that time. So the IT department, the public safety department, and the newly formed emergency management department came together. They came together and said, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to uh, get rid of all these 58 separate standalone systems that we have out there. We're going to consolidate them all together. We're going to move it into the data center. IT is going to take over management and control of the infrastructure, not the applications and not the endpoints, but of the underlying infrastructure to ensure that we have systems that work for us when we need them to work for us. So what was the bottom line for this? What were the results that came out of this? Well, first and foremost, the public safety department and the emergency management department were able to create a safer campus and reduce their overall risk. It increased their ability to respond to, to detect and respond to and mitigate incidents that occur. It increased their ability to manage um, major events that might ha be happening on their campus at a particular time. It even improved the safety of their own people, of their own responders during incidents, giving them the situational awareness that they needed. On the other end of the spectrum, because they went to a, a, a hyper-converged infrastructure type of architecture, the IT department was really happy because they were able to reduce the overall cost and complexity required to deliver the kind of infrastructure that the, secure, uh, that the public safety and emergency manage department, management department needed. Okay, so everyone wins. We have a safer environment, lower risk. We have a happier IT department with lower cost and lower complexity. We're able to uh, achieve the results that everyone was looking for. Now here's a different, a very different scenario. This is FedEx ground in North America, I believe this is US and Canada, is a <clears throat> very different than UCF in that they're a very decentralized uh, type of deployment. They have almost a thousand warehouse and distribution facilities across the US with a relatively small number of cameras uh, in each site. And the challenge that they had was not so much what, what we saw with U UCF, but the challenge was they didn't have a lot of local IT resource at each one of their facilities to deploy and manage all these systems. So they needed a solution that was very simple to deploy, um, very simple to manage, uh, that of course uh, would scale as their needs would change over time. 
And what they deployed was, again, a hyper-converged solution in each one of these uh, hundreds of, you know, close to a thousand or so facilities out there. Again, to, to handle a relatively small number of systems. The great thing about this, though, is that this entire solution nationwide can be managed centrally by one person. And so if we look at the overall business results that FedEx Ground was able to uh, to realize from this rapid deployment of new facilities, down from three days down to a couple of hours. Very, very important for FedEx that we that we help them deploy very quickly. Highly simplified um, deployment and management. Okay, these systems were pre-configured, pre-programmed, pre-everything. They're sent to the site, they gotta be plugged in, turned on, and everything works. And of course, probably the most important thing is that we greatly simplified the management and support. We enable them to manage all of their sites from one centralized location, one centralized uh, pane of glass, as we call it. So very, very simple. This is very important to the IT department, as well as to the public safety, or excuse me, to the security group within FedEx, that we can deliver a safe environment but do so in a way that the IT department is happy with the way everything is deployed. And then the last example I will talk to you about is a little bit different kind of use case. This is, um, you probably recognize the company, Iron Mountain. Most people know Iron Mountain. They're a records management, records retention company. They've been around for a long, long time. They decided a few years ago to expand their business offerings to include video archive, video data archive and backup services that they can offer actually out to their customers out there. So when they went to build what they ultimately became called the Iron Cloud for video, they needed an infrastructure solution that of course was optimized for video and worked very well for video, but they needed something that was highly scalable this is something that over time they expected to start relatively small and then grow to a very, very large basis as their customers sign up for this kind of service. They of course needed something that was enterprise class. Uh, Iron Cloud is a, Iron Cloud for Video is part of the broader Iron Cloud offering that enables them to deliver cloud type services for all kinds of different environments. So they needed this video surveillance solution to fit within that Iron Cloud Enterprise offering. And of course, they needed it to be very cost competitive. So they decided on hyperconverged infrastructure to deploy for their, what is called their Iron Cloud for Video offering. And the bottom line for them is they now have a new service. They now have a new service that they can offer out to their customers that is a secure enterprise class data center that their customers can use for cloud-based video archive and backup. Fits in very well with Iron Cloud's core mission as a business. Of course, they have a solution that can scale. They can start from relatively small, for, for, for them what is relatively small, about a, a petabyte worth of storage up to 10, 10 to 20 petabytes, what they're expecting to go to in the ne relatively near future. And of course, Resiliency is incredibly important to them because they're not just storing their own data, they're storing their customers' data. So they have now an SLA, they have a commitment to their customers that they will store and protect that data, ensure that it is always accessible for them when they need it, whenever that happens to be. And of course they needed to do so, they're going to invest fairly heavily in this and needed to do so in a way that was very competitive from a pricing standpoint it can help them realize the returns that they were ultimately searching for. Okay, so that being said, um, I hope we've uh, done a job about describing here how security and IT can work together to talk uh, about physical security, video surveillance, IoT types of deployments, um, I, I hope that we understand that security departments and IT departments 
think differently. What's important to each one of them um, are different. But I, but I hope we also understand that when we work together and we educate each other, we can come together in a way that delivers uh, a, a fair amount of value to our organization um, in a very collaborative manner. Okay. That being said, I think I'll turn it back now and see if there are any questions. Very good. Thank you, Brandon. That was a great presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have a lot of questions coming in. I'd encourage you to go ahead and ask yours, though. If we uh, do not get a chance to go to all questions during the live event, we will follow up after. As well, I believe Brandon uh, Pivot3 is going to be on the floor at the GSX coming up next month. Isn't that right? Uh, that's right. Thank you for reminding me, Mike. I've got a note here. We will be at GSX at the Expo, uh, booth number 2471. We welcome you to come visit us. I'm happy, we'd, we'd be happy to talk to you in more depth there at the show. Great. Booth 2471. Okay, so that's a great way to continue this conversation. But right, la right now, let's go ahead and continue it today. Brandon, our first question. Uh, when you're looking at global enterprise architecture, the normal is to have local storage with archival storage off-site at a data center. How does cloud architecture apply to this, and can you address latency issues for a monitoring or command center? Um, sure. Okay. There's a couple of questions there built in, I think. So first is, how can we leverage cloud? You know, I, I think that, as I, I sort of mentioned earlier, when we talk about cloud in the world of physical security and video surveillance, uh, we Im immediately think about our cameras, our video streaming directly to the Internet and going off to some public cloud um, center somewhere and then accessing all it all through some kind of web-based, uh, you know, browser interface. And while that is certainly one of the cloud architectures that we can leverage, there are many other types of cloud architectures that um, – are important and available for us to leverage as well. In video surveillance, the, one of the challenge, one of the biggest challenges is I think the the uh, person that asked the question is referring to is there's it's very bandwidth intensive, and so it's with larger systems it's, it's kind of unrealistic for us to just say we're going to stream everything up to the cloud. So there will always typically be, in my opinion, is most likely to be a component of on-site storage associated with any kind of cloud-type deployment. But then we say, okay, what is it that we can leverage via the cloud, either the public cloud or a private cloud kind of architecture that we can use in our video surveillance? And what I'll say is there's a couple of different ways we can do that. We can, we can move data and archive it up to a, a quote-unquote cloud environment. We can put components of the system up in the cloud. So maybe you have things like uh, your video analytics application up in the cloud, or maybe you have things like your, your integrated systems like access control into the cloud. And then as, as the person rightfully asks, what about latency issues when it comes to the operation center? I think that that's something that you absolutely have to take into consideration, especially if you're talking about public cloud kind of environments. If you need access to real-time video or you need real-time access to recorded video, uh, latent, the latency between your site and a public cloud uh, deployment may be unacceptable. And so you may look at maybe a private cloud kind of environment or it, it may necessitate that you have to keep all of that um, you know, on-premise somewhere, maybe in your own central um, um, data center. So th those are all very important points. So, you know, we, we can't change physics right now. Um, the bandwidth and the latency is what it is. It's increasing. It's all getting better. Um, but but uh, there are some limitations there that have to be considered in every deployment. Very good. Our next question and is, uh, is one, anytime we come within 100 miles of this area is asked, um, how do we convince the IT department? They look for recognizable solutions. What will they recognize? I'm going to anticipate a little here that uh, your answer is going to have something to do with collaborative leadership. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, when we talk about 
how to convince the IT department? Well, like I said before, number one, we have to we have to educate them. We have to under, help them understand why video is different, how it's different, how some of their their quote unquote familiar solutions um, may not be the most optimal for video surveillance. But also, we need to help them understand that in our deployments, we want to leverage um, standard, common, familiar IT technology. Uh, for example, at Pivot3, we use server virtualization um, solutions from VMware. I think something like 80% of all the organizations in the world use VMware for server virtualization. And what that means is they're, they're, familiar, not, they're not only familiar with the technology, but it plugs right in to their existing infrastructure, to their existing management tools. The things that they're used to using on a day-in, day-out basis, they want to continue to be able to use that on a day-in, day-out basis. So I think it's important that we look at, um, that they understand that the IT technologies that, that they're deploying um, are familiar to them, are pretty common. And quite frankly, if you go to an IT department and talk about hyper-converged infrastructure, they're, in many cases, they're going to know what you mean. They're going to know what you're talking about. That's not a term that we made up or anything. That's a very commonly used term in the IT world today. Yeah, using the same language is always the first step. Um, yeah. Our next question is rather specific. The, the uh, attendee asked about an integration with access control systems like S2. To spend a moment on that, but if you could um, take the larger issue, what does the landscape look like about uh, integration with access control systems? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, access control integration was certainly one of the first um, integrations to occur in the video surveillance world and vice versa. Um, it's a very commonly deployed practice, especially in enterprise solutions out there today. Um, and I encourage it, of course, more and more. I think the, the more integrated our systems are, our various applications and systems are, the more value we, we uh, recognize out of them. Now, that being said, S2 is one of the access control systems out there. Um, what I will tell you, and I kind of mentioned this in the presentation, when we talk about hyper-converged infrastructure, really any underlying infrastructure, servers, storage, networking, there is not, this isn't always true, but certainly in the case of Pivot3, there's no, um, engineering integration required okay so a system like s2 as long as it integrates with the video management software whoever that video management software is then it's going to work okay there's no there's no technical integration required between s2 and, and pivot 3 for example there's no technical integration required between whatever vms it is whether it's milestone or genetech or onssi or whoever it happens to be um, in Pivot 3, there's no integration required. So there's application level integration, but that's sort of one, that's one level above where we sit. Very good. Our next question uh, actually harkens back to a poll we asked. I think they asked it at the time of the poll. Who is best suited to perform the day-to-day -day management of the server and storage infrastructure for a video system and why? So if you could maybe speak to the, the different strengths and possible weaknesses of each of these taking primary responsibility for day-to-day -day management. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'll say that, uh, first of all, I'll qualify this and say it depends. Obviously, it's gonna depend on the organization <laughs> and the capabilities that, that you have in your organization. But as a rule of thumb, you know, as a general rule of thumb, I would, I would suggest and recommend that the IT department handle the day-to-day management and administration of the underlying infrastructure. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean the applications or the endpoints per se, although they can, they can, they probably have the ability to do that as well, but they don't necessarily have to do that. But the reason I say the underlying infrastructure is as, as, as these systems get larger and larger, they do become a little bit more complex. Um, um, they, they do require, you know, some level of day-to-day of -day, um, interaction and in, in 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 management and maintenance. And this is what IT does. I mean, this is, this is what they do on a day-in, day-out basis for all of their other systems already. This is what they're paid to do. This is what they're trained to do. 
Um, this is typically not what security departments are paid to do and trained to do. You know, I mean, security departments are there to deliver a service or to deliver a function within their organization that typically isn't managing system infrastructure. <laughs> applications are a little bit different because that we, we use those applications to actually do our jobs in security. So, you know, if you have the capabilities for it, if you have the resources, of course, available, and the willingness and the agreement between the organizations, I'd say it's, it's, it's very good practice to have the IT departments in charge of managing the day-to-day -day aspects of the underlying infrastructure. Very good. Um, next question. With cloud or off-site hosting, how will the question of video data integrity with respect to courtroom evidence be addressed? Uh, the questioner notes that we need to be able to ensure the data stands up to scrutiny from defense attorneys. What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, chain of evidence, right? So a um, very important uh, topic, and there's, there's a couple of different ways, and there's a number, of fact, of different ways um, that chain of evidence is preserved and maintained. Number one, it starts with the um, the application itself. So if it's an evidence management system, an evidence management application, oftentimes they have ways of watermarking the data or, or doing different things to the video to ensure that it can't be um, tampered with or somehow altered uh, once it leaves. Secondly is um, from an infrastructure in a, in a cloud service for, um, standpoint, you need to look for offerings that meet um, CGIS requirements. CGIS is criminal justice information security. And uh, part of maintaining that chain of custody or chain of evidence is, um, is ensuring that we meet those CGIS requirements, which are fairly strict. You know, they're, they're fairly in-depth and, and, and don't automatically assume that all public cloud infrastructure meets CGIS requirements. Some of them don't, okay? And, and some of, even within some of those public clouds, some of those offerings don't. Um, and then thirdly, what I would suggest is there are ways and solutions out there that um, enable you to add a layer of security to the data itself through encryption technologies, for example. Uh, so that ensures that data can be encrypted and secured. That means it can't be tampered with. In, in, in many cases, it means it can actually be transported and moved from one location to another um, along with the quote unquote key that's required to decrypt that data and, and use it. And, and that technology has advanced to the point now that it is really, really solid, very advanced, um, and quite frankly, not that expensive. Um, so I encourage you, if you're doing that, especially in a public cloud environment, look for applications that offer um, chain of custody uh, features, look for um, cloud environments that offer CGIS compliance, and look for encryption technologies. Very good. Um, we have time for just one more question, but I think uh, this is a good one to go out on. Um, the specific question is, is regarding custom integrations to hardware and VMS solutions. I know you can't speak to uh, all the strategies about that, but if, if you could give us a word on on what, what to be looking for in terms of custom integrations, what to be wary of, and, and any notes you have on hardware and VMS solutions. Well, yeah, so I, I will, first of all, I, I, will, I will warn you against any software solutions that require custom integration to hardware. Um, when, that, when that happens, when you have hardware and software that has to be integrated together, it can create a lot of challenges. What typically happens is that it works when it comes out of the factory and it probably works when you initially deploy it. But we all know that particularly software changes regularly. And oftentimes you may get to a situation where you've got to update the software for whatever reason, for new features or for security enhancements, whatever it is, and that update will break the integration to the hardware. So I, unless you're, you know, unless you're Apple, quite frankly, who tightly controls both the software and the hardware development, 
under the same roof, um, I, I recommend against that. When you do have other kinds of custom integrations, especially if they're integrations between software applications from, from different vendors, then th those kind of things are, um, you know, are quite frankly just a, a major part of what we do now in, in, in the world today, Ac you know, video to access integration, for example. You want to look for solutions that provide the appropriate APIs and SDKs um, to ensure that those integrations don't break. And, and what I mean by that, it's, it's kind of hard to explain without showing you a, a picture, but effectively some of the providers, let's just say they cordon off a piece of their software, and that cordoned off piece is reserved for the integration linkage to another piece of software. And so that way, if they change the underlying software, if they make updates for features or other enhancements and things like that, they don't come back and break that link in between the two. So look for software that, that leverages that kind of capability. I know there are a number of them out there that do. And you want to look for um, you want to look for that on both sides, you know, the, the various applications that you're integrating. Outstanding. Brandon, that, that is all the time we have today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. I'd like to thank you for uh, uh, all your good questions and your responses in the polls. I would direct your attention to the resources panel. Brandon has provided a lot of additional resources there. You can download. There's a lot of good information there. Um, again, uh, I encourage you, if you have not uh, already made uh, arrangements, GSX this year is going to be a, a great new event. Um, there's a lot of new stuff going on there. It's a good opportunity to continue this conversation as well. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Pivot3, for making this event possible. And, of course, our special thanks to Brandon for so generously sharing his expertise. For ASIS and Security Management Magazine, I'm Mike Moran. Have a great day.